The stories shared on It Takes Balls are unique to the individual sharing. Always speak with your trusted medical provider for treatment options specific to you. Welcome back to It Takes Balls, presented by Testicular Cancer Awareness Foundation. Today, I'm joined by Paul Savage Jr. He's the president and CEO of Savage Creative Solutions and an Amazon best-selling author. But today, we're talking about his testicular cancer journey. Paul, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. So tell me, who is Paul Savage Jr.? Like, outside of cancer, what do you do? Uh, so I'm a marketing, advertising, and public relations professional. So I handle all three of those areas for businesses and organizations and varying levels of industries across the United States. Awesome. So as the president and CEO of your, your company, um, had you started your company like before you were diagnosed? I had, so I had started it back in college as kind of a means of putting together a portfolio and having something to show potential employers. And I was fortunate enough that as I progressed in my career, I was able to kind of keep it as a side hustle and maintain the clients that I had. Um, and I was kind of at the the peak of the business at the time, if you will, getting ready to go full time with it when I was diagnosed with testicular cancer. So let's talk about that diagnosis. You were, I believe, 27, you said, in your submission. So tell me about like leading up to it and then finally being diagnosed. Yeah, so I had actually just changed jobs probably less than a month before that um, when I kind of noticed that I noticed a mass on one of my testicles and was feeling some discomfort and kind of knew something wasn't right. Um, But I was absolutely terrified about even asking for time off or something like that because I didn't have any time off at that point. Um, And so I ended up going in and kind of letting the president know that I didn't I didn't think something was right. And he ended up very, being very understanding and said he would rather have me there in the long term and in the short term to to go ahead and go get checked out and do what I need to do. Yeah. So was testicular cancer like on your radar or something that was even possible at that time or you had just noticed it and then you were like, well, that's not right. It, it really wasn't. I knew something wasn't right, but I mean, at 27, I didn't think cancer was definitely not the first thing that crossed my mind and nobody in my family had had cancer that young. So it was kind of a completely foreign concept to me at that point. So you said when they initially were looking at it, they thought it was cyst, but the mass continued to grow. So tell me about that. Like how long did that take place? Yeah. So I went and got um, blood work done and an ultrasound done. The blood work came back negative for cancer. The ultrasound didn't show any solid signs of mass. And so at that point, the doctors thought it was a clump of cysts, albeit a large clump of cysts, larger than they had typically seen. Um, but all the indicators showed that it it wasn't cancer at that point. And so they gave me some antibiotics and said to kind of keep an eye on it. And it was probably three or four months after that, that I noticed it was getting bigger and I still had it. Um, And so I went back again, the blood work still showed negative for cancer, but at that point, the ultrasound started showing some solid signs. And so it was at that point that they recommended that I get an orchiectomy. And what was that turnaround between when they recommended the orchiectomy and when you got it? It was a whirlwind. So I think it was less than a week within a matter of days. I had gotten an orchiectomy. (laughs) Yeah. So did you bank sperm? I know in your submission, you said that you did. Did you bank sperm before your orchiectomy or did you do that after? I did. So I didn't get to bank as much as I was hoping for. So I'm still not quite sure if that will ever play out. Um, I was going through this experience during COVID. And so there were very limited times that I would, the facility was available for me to go up and bank. And then I had to start chemo right away on that following Monday too. So I was able to bank, um, but I haven't had a chance to test or kind of see what that looked like afterwards yet. When you got your pathology back from your orchiectomy and like they said, yep, it was cancer. Like what did that do to you? Uh, Honestly, my first thought was my family and my parents. Um, I have kind of older parents and I know their health isn't necessarily the best either. And so that 
my first thought actually went to my family and kind of how it was going to affect them. And so I immediately kind of put up this wall and of course how fast everything was moving really didn't give me time to think about anything else anyways. And so I kind of just tried to stay as strong as I could for, for them and just trust in my faith and know that if I went through the process, everything was going to be okay and worry about the rest later. (laughs) Yeah. So you did have chemo, you had BEP. I did. Yep. Three rounds. So tell me about like, did you have any like notable events where there's side effects? Tell me about the compounding. Uh, So the, my side effects were pretty minimal. Uh, my body seemed to handle the the chemo pretty well. There was one point around like the 11th day, it seemed like ev- every cycle where I would get really dehydrated. And um, that that first cycle, I actually ended up passing out and they had to call the paramedics and brought me in and gave me some fluids. And so after that, we kind of knew, okay, day 10 and 11, I really got a drink. Um, but other than that, I got some nausea and just a lot of fatigue, um, but my body held up pretty well. Yeah. So, I mean, during chemo and you said during COVID, like in your, with your parents being older, were they able to come with you or like where everything was kind of strange? They weren't. Well, there was, there was one person allowed with me. Um, so the family and friends would kind of swap out throughout the different cycles. Everybody kind of had a day that they would come up and, and support. And then there was one time, um, I ended up getting a blood clot from the port, um, that caused me to have a temperature and kind of postpone my, my chemo in the last few days of the third cycle. Um, and at that point, nobody was allowed to be with me. So I was in the hospital for about a week by myself oh my during gosh. that period. <laughs> so with that clot, um, I think that's the first that I've heard of that. I mean, can you elaborate more about what that was like? Yeah. So I started getting a temperature, um, which of course, anytime you get a temperature, you're supposed to report it to your doctor. And so I reported it to him and he told me, um, it kind of felt like I had a stiff neck. I had reported that to my doctor at my previous, um, doctor's appointment right before that. And they gave me a muscle relaxer. Um, but it didn't seem to really help. And then I didn't think anything of it again until the temperature started happening. And so when it was over 48 hours of still having a temperature, they had me go up and get checked. And that's when they did an ultrasound and realized that there was a blood clot in my right arm and a couple of different places that was caused by the port. Um, and so they kept me in the hospital and gave me blood thinners and kind of monitored me for a week um, until that blood clot dissolved enough that they felt comfortable and the temperature came back down in order to move forward with chemotherapy. Wow. That's scary. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Jumping back Especially to when we had people like massaging my neck and stuff, trying to make it feel better. And we're like, <laughs> oh, yeah, I could have broken off and yeah. been a lot worse. Um, jumping back to when you had passed out. So that was dehydration. It was. Yeah. And like, I don't think I've talked to anybody who's done that. So what was like, I mean, you were passed out, so you might not know the response, but I mean, what was the paramedics came and what was all that like? Do you remember any of it? Or was there somebody there to tell you about it? I remember it vaguely. Um, So I had just gotten home from the chemo session and I started feeling really hot and clammy and my heart was racing. And so I kind of called my parents over to to sit by me because I knew something wasn't right. And I told them I really just wanted to go lay down. And so they got me up to go lay down and I took probably two or three steps and then passed out in the hallway on the way to my bed to go lay down. Oh my God. Um, and so the paramedics came and, and checked everything. And at that point they said all of the vital signs pretty much looked fine, but we called and reported it to my doctor. And the doctor said that was likely dehydration and I needed to come in right away and get some fluids. And so they took me in and gave me fluids at the hospital. Jeez. That's scary too. So you were during your treatment, you were blogging. Tell me about that. Yeah. So I kind of debated for a while about how open I wanted to be about this journey. Um, but I, 
I also decided very early on that I wanted to share everything, the positives and the negatives. Um, and of course, being a, a marketer and somebody who does social media for a living, it came pretty natural to share all aspects of my life and this journey on social media. And then the I, got, I had a massive amount of support throughout the journey, which was great. Um, but after going through chemo and different things like that, I couldn't always keep up with the messages and the responses that I was getting. And so I thought a blog would be a great way to to share my journey and um, kind of keep people updated on what I was going through, but also give me something to look back on and, and see how far I had actually come. Because a lot of times in this journey, things are moving so fast that you don't you don't really see how far you have actually come. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's great insight. So then you turned your blogs into a book. I did. Um, so about a year after I had concluded my my surgery and everything, I was still getting responses from wives, mothers, other cancer survivors, um, kind of thanking me for, for sharing my journey. And it was actually them who suggested that I turn it into a book. And so I had worked with an author in California as one of my clients. Um, and so through that process, I kind of learned how to publish a book and took those blog posts and those blog posts ultimately became Diary of a Testicular Cancer Survivor. That's awesome. Congratulations. Thank you. What kind of response has the book gotten? I mean, obviously it's a best selling, so. Yeah, it it's actually been really surprising and, and very gratifying to read the reviews and hear different responses from people who are going through that journey or who have shared the book with with family members who are going through testicular cancer and that sort of thing. And so it's been it's been very rewarding to see my experience be able to help somebody else as well. Yeah. And like you said, like even with this podcast, like a lot of the feedback, like I know guys listening to it, I see like the the analytics, but the feedback that I get and probably you get is primarily like the caregivers and the moms who are like, you know, my son is going through this and I'm so thankful that this is out there. So, I mean, that makes you feel like the bad stuff was worth it. Absolutely. So in survivorship, you are now, you were diagnosed at 27 and you're now 30. So mm -hmm. I don't know if it's exactly three years, but where exactly are you in your Yes, I believe three years will be June. So we're coming up on it. Um, so I still have some um, blood work that they do every couple of months or so. And then a CT scan, I believe it's every six months now. Um, and so we're kind of at that surveillance stage right now. <laughs> yeah. So talk to me about like, um, I mean, have you had any side effects? Have you noticed anything different about yourself since chemo? So the biggest side effect I've had um, has been from a hernia that formed when I had my RPL and D surgery. Um, it kind of limits what I can do sometimes. And then um, I do have some neuropathy that pops up in my feet occasionally. Um, but considering the grand scheme of things, I'm thankful that that's that's my only side effects. <laughs> yeah. And I'm sorry, I skipped the RPL and D. So after you completed chemo and then they, had, I guess, had seen in a CT maybe that. Yeah. Um, so they, they did a CT scan immediately after my chemo concluded. And that's when they, they saw that there was still the other type there. And did you have your RPL and D in Louisiana? I did. I was blessed that we had a, a strong enough and big enough healthcare system here that I was able to get all of my care done here. What is Shreveport like? Like I've never... I've heard of it, but I've never even seen pictures or anything. Like, is it a rural? Is it like a suburb of a big city? Yeah, it, I would like to say it's got big city opportunities with small town vibes. <laughs> um, so it's a pretty big city, but you can get anywhere that you're kind of looking to go to within a, a few minutes. We often have a, a tagline that says we're the healthcare capital of the Arklatex, Ar Arkansas, Louisiana, Texas. Um, and so we have probably one of the, the best healthcare systems around here, aside from driving kind of towards the Dallas area. So I, 
I was very blessed in that respect. What is the, uh, for anybody who's listening, who's in that area, what is the name of the healthcare system? If they don't already know. Sure. I was treated in, uh, at Willis Knighton. So I was part of the Willis Knighton health system here. Cool. So tell me more about the RPLND. Like what was your, um, residual mass that they saw? If you have any like stats on what that looked like and do you have any like retrograde ejaculation or anything? Yeah, so there were three different areas that they were kind of worried about um, based on the CT scan afterwards that caused them to go ahead and decide to do the RPL and D. Um, and that that was quite an experience as well because of COVID. Um, so I had to quarantine for two weeks before that surgery started. Um, so I kind of went around and kind of saw all of the family that was there and, you know, and took pictures and kind of um, let them know what was going on and then quarantined for two weeks up to that. And then my dad was the only person that was allowed to actually be with me on the day that I had the surgery. So everybody else kind of sat in the car outside in the parking lot and waited on the news. Um, and so it ended up being about a seven hour operation that left a scar from, I guess, underneath my right armpit across to my chest and then down my chest. Wow. Um, but it was a, an operation that ultimately left me cancer free. Yeah. Can't beat that with a stick. And then, uh, to answer your other question, no, I actually didn't have any retrograde ejaculation. Um, so I'm not sure about kind of the sperm counts after the chemo. I haven't had a chance to test for that yet. Um, but I didn't have any of the retrograde. That's good. What was recovery like? Uh, it, it was tough um the first few days were kind of foggy because i was on a lot of drugs um and i i guess it's hard to even think back it was only a couple years ago or so but it seems like it was so much farther than that i guess with covid and everything <laughs> but um at best i can remember i handled it pretty well i i know i had kind of trouble laying on certain sides and had to take some pain pills for a few days, um, but they weaned me off of those after about day three or four. Um, and then after that, it was just kind of making sure that I followed their advice so that the, the scar scabbed correctly and kind of formed correctly. And um, I think the biggest thing that from the, that experience that I remember was just making sure that I got up and moved afterwards. Um, there was a couple of days after where I just kind of sat around and didn't feel like I could do anything. And ultimately the scab formed harder than, and it, it was more painful than it was. And so I think that was, that was probably my best advice for that was even when it hurts, just do a little something, get up and walk a few steps or do a little something and keep moving so that as you're healing, um, it kind of makes that process less painful. <laughs> yeah. I don't remember exactly when the um, COVID vaccine came out, but it was, was it, I can't remember if that was in 2020. Was that something that they were like talking about? Like, you know, with your counts being low, like, should you get the shot? Did you even want the shot? Like, what was that? If you want to talk about that, I don't know if you want to talk about that. Yeah. So it came out, I believe it was a couple of months after my RPL and D surgery. Um, and they did recommend that I get it. And of course, several of my family members are um, in the healthcare industry. My mom's an RN. Um, so she kind of encouraged me to get it as well. And so I did get the vaccine shortly after um, the conclusion of that RPL and D surgery. And after I'd kind of healed a little bit. Okay. I was curious, like if it was, if it came out like while you were in chemo, maybe and like what that discussion yeah, was it like. came out right after. Yeah. Well, that's good. Um, so in survivorship, I mean, a lot of the things that we deal with as survivors is, uh, are similar, like in survivor's guilt and anxiety and stuff. So tell me about your experience with either or both of those. Yeah. So it, it it's tough because, um, I think anxiety is probably the biggest one for me. Um, just anytime there's a blood test or, um, you know, a CT scan or, or even just when you're, you're doing a self-check and 
momentarily you feel something that you don't think is right. And all of a sudden you're just anxiety ridden for the next few hours until you actually kind of feel around and then realize, okay, that is normal. This is normal. Um, but it's just little things like that, that kind of really peak your anxiety and anxiety was something I never dealt with prior to this, but it's something that now pops up quite frequently in my daily life. <laughs> yeah. I think a lot of guys can relate. Um, what advice do you have for anybody who's like just staring down the barrel of testicular cancer? Like maybe they're, they found this podcast because there's something that they feel is off and they haven't yet been to the doctor. Um, I guess my advice would be kind of two prongs. So my first advice would be don't wait um, and be an advocate for your own health. You know, your body better than anybody um, you know what's normal, and even when the results may not show it right away, just be an advocate for your health and and let somebody know that something's not right. Um, and then just kind of try to stay positive and, and keep your faith throughout the experience. And often humor is a great way to get through it. Um, humor was something that really helped me with my journey as I kind of went through it. And um I think sometimes family members don't quite understand humor, but kind of explain to them that humor is what helps you get through really helped me a lot as well. Um, because then we all kind of were able to joke about things and, you know, make things a little lighter during a really dark situation. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, and then you have another book coming out. This is going to, this episode is going to come out April 29th. I don't know when your uh, book is set to come out, but if you know those details, yeah, so share. It's, um, the, it's actually a sequel to one that's out right now. Um, so chemo containment was an idea that I had when I was going through my cancer journey. I actually started it while I was in the hospital. Um, and basically I took, it's a fictional story of an idea of, about a guy who's going through cancer um, but I took it and made it a lot worse than what I was going through. And essentially, I think that's kind of how I coped and got through my journey um, was kind of writing this story about a boy who had testicular cancer and the chemo ends up giving him this ability to control electricity. And the government wants to kind of tap into that and is on the hunt for him. And so I kind of wrote that journey as I was going going through it. And now the sequel chemo compound, um, will be coming out later this spring. <laughs> awesome. That's really cool. Is that how, so it sounds like, I mean, between writing your blogs and writing this, like that's kind of what you did to pass the time or did you do this at home? Yeah, I, I did a lot of writing throughout it. Um, so I was very bled while I was going through it with uh, COVID and was very isolated and alone during many aspects of it. There were some positive parts. And one of those was I was furloughed um, from my job during that time period. So I was paid and didn't have to worry about working going through that. And so that gave me the opportunity to really kind of write and express my thoughts and relax a little bit throughout the journey as well, which, which was a positive and all that as well. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you for mentioning that. Cause I was going to ask you like if you had gone on short-term disability or anything and being self-employed as well, how that went. Yep. So when well, we, at that point I was actually working in a full-time position. Um, and so I didn't go full-time with my job until after kind of the, the cancer situation. Okay. Did that like, did the cancer situation have any kind of like influence on that? Like you were thinking life is short, go for it or something. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so I, I had tried a couple of times before that going full time and it, it was just not the time and didn't work out. Um, but kind of after the whole cancer situation, it did give me another perspective of, you know, there's no time like the present. And that's when I ended up going full time and it, I'm still full time right now. It's worked out. And so I think it, it ultimately gave me the the drive that I really needed to be able to go full time and do what I love and live my dream full time. <laughs> it took balls to do that. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> uh, is there anything else that you want to add that I did not ask about? Uh, I would like to share 
So another thing that's kind of gotten brought up as people have read Diary of a Testicular Cancer Survivor is they'll say things like, I wish I had chronicled my journey or I wish I had blogged about my experience kind of to be able to look back upon and see their experience. And so I did create um, a journal that's available on Amazon. I think it's called the My Cancer Treatment Journal. Um, And it kind of lays out a framework for people to do exactly what I did while I was going through my cancer journey. And it allows you to kind of fill in um, how you're feeling that day, what your symptoms are, um, a place to ask things for your doctor, um, some note pages to kind of blog about your journey. Um, and so if anybody's interested in kind of chronicling their journey in that same way, there's an opportunity for them to do that with that journal. That's a great idea. I mean, you've got people covered from, you know, the entertainment <laughs> with this, the fiction story. You got people covered with writing their own stuff. I mean, that's great. Shout out to you. <laughs> Thanks. And that's another thing, like, you know, the chemo chair is, is you're sitting there for a long time. So if you're going through it, take a coloring book or take Paul's book or, you know, whatever, because it's going to be a long day. Yep. <laughs> Where can Especially on some of those go ahead? Especially on some of those, like the my B day, if you will, that was almost an eight hour day kind of towards the first of each cycle. So. Yeah. Where can people find you if they want to? talk to you more or find your, your books? Yeah. So, uh, diary of a testicular cancer survivor is available on Amazon and then chemo containment is available online at pretty much any major retailer, Walmart, Barnes and Noble, Amazon target, um, and chemo compound will be available there as well. And then the cancer journal is available in a hardcover on Amazon as well. That's awesome. Paul Savage Jr., thank you so much for being on It Takes Balls. Awesome. Thank you for having me. For more information and resources for your testicular cancer journey, visit testiculaircancerawarenessfoundation.org. You can also follow us on social media at Testis Cancer. We're on Facebook at Testicular Cancer Awareness Foundation.